What's going on out there, friends? And thanks again for joining us here on Expanded Perspectives. That's right. It's me, Cam Hale. And as always, sitting next to me, me amigo, Mr. Kyle Filson. How's it going, everybody? Yes, I'm here in beautiful Skeleton Studios, ready to do a show. We had to we had to cut it off and, and start recording, because Kyle and I have been in here ranting for the last five minutes about horror movies, since it's getting close to Hall- All Hallows' Eve. Yeah, yeah, right? One of my favorite times of year falls here. I love this time of year. has yeah. all the things I enjoy. It was in the 50s this morning. I know. It was awesome. I'm, I I couldn't wait. Any, I mean, because like just a couple days before that, it was 90-something. Yeah. I was like, man, it's fall. Where is the cold weather? You wake up one day, and there it is. And it's supposed to get up in the 90s again this week, but then yeah. drop back down into the highs of 60s. For a little bit after that. But what we were yelling at each other about and laughing about was horror movies. Kyle's wife loves them. like And and Luke. Well, of course, Luke. But he gets it, of course, from his mother. But y- you and I, when we were kids, man, we watched every horror movie you could get your hands on. Like, we watched everything. I, I think mean, I like the, the slasher movies and stuff because yeah, you got to yeah. see, like, nudity sometimes. Yeah, you can nip slip every now and again. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. So as a kid, I thought that was entertaining. You you're a 12 year old boy and a boob falls out. It made your whole month. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you couldn't rewind it or nothing, though. I mean, so you like had to be there to, to, to witness the, the reveal, even if it was like a tenth of a second. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're the buddies at school. They'd tell you, like, oh, at the like eight minute mark and on your VCR, you know, you would have a clock so you could like tick, you know, clock the that counter. Thing. Yeah. You'd yeah. I remember there. like Fast Times at Ridgemont High. Fast like, forwarding to that counter mark. Oh, oh here VHS we go. The machine was the best, right? But what it was that, that we were laughing about, there wasn't any of like these. Yeah, like The Exorcist and stuff, but like the shows like Sinister and and all of these uh, Annabelle. Yeah, I don't remember there being when we had Chucky before we had Annabelle, right? I mean, that's what I remember that we had as far as like a crazy killer, yeah, uh, doll or something along. But I don't remember it being quite you know as dark. Of course, everything evolves. But what got us on the the whole path, folks, was I went and saw the second It this weekend with my wife and my daughter, and Kyle asked me what I thought, and to be honest, I'm not a fan. Yeah, that's what you said. I'm not a fan. There's too much. You see the clown too much, and there's too much CGI. And I still think it's scarier, not only when it's, I guess, more natural, but when you don't see the threat as much. Oh, yeah, I agree. Like, even for the big reveal, I don't, you have to, it's more fun to me whenever you leave it up to people's imagination, like, I always go back to Jaws, like a movie like that, when you don't really see the shark for the longest time and you just know it's coming and the tension. And it's it's always like you think about it whenever your parents or like maybe your boss or the principal or anybody you're dealing with goes, I need to have a discussion or a loved one. We need to talk when you get that. We need to talk text or that. We need to talk letter or I need you to come into my office tomorrow morning email. It may be simply nothing more than, hey, you're doing a great job. But in the in your mind, before you know that, you're building up the craziest stuff in your mind. Right, yeah. And so that was the way I feel like with these movies now. It's like, to me, a scarier movie would have been if they didn't show it as and, and you brought up you liked the television series more than the new the it movies that yeah, it doesn't got now. And it, it doesn't it's trash but yeah, still you know, say it doesn't hold up now. But when I saw that as a child or a teenager, young teenager, yeah, I mean it was terrifying. Uh, it, sometimes, sometimes things are good when they come out and they're not meant to be remade. That's another thing. When we were younger, all the movies were pretty much original ideas. Where like nowadays, I feel like the theater yeah. is overrun with a continuation <clears throat> or a prequel or another reversion. I mean, Spider Man's the worst. They've made eighteen versions of <laughs> Spider Man one in the last ten years. Yeah, yeah, it feels every other summer there's another Spider Man, and it's not. A continuation of the story. It's the same story. Well, Why I, would I continue to go? I can tell you what's going to happen. Peter Parker's going to go on a field trip. He's going to get bit by a radioactive spider. Uncle Ben dies. Uncle Ben dies, <laughs> right? I mean, you know the story. Why do they keep coming out with the same one? And then like Top Gun, which is a classic movie that well, I know we'll just make a, a prequel to it or a continuation. No. If you want to make a movie about jets, make a whole new movie about jets. There's still naval aviators still going to Top Gun flight school. Exactly. You can still create a separate movie with a separate narrative with fighter jets. I mean, the F-14s are retired, for Christ's sakes. You got to do one with a new jet, like the F-18 Super Hornets, you know, or some stealth bombers or something. Or, oh, man, what's the name of the the top secret jet that we're supposed to have? The Aurora or whatever. Do that. Why do you got to always... Jaws, 
is an incredible movie. That's a movie that still holds up. And you know why? It's because great white sharks are real. <laughs> That's right. And so that is a possibility. That movie was so good that it literally changed hundreds of thousands of people's view about swimming. Like that movie. It, it changed it sparked, a whole generation. It sparked a whole new sport of shark fishing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't think shark fishing, nobody even cared up on Long Island and up, up on Montauk and stuff before that movie came out. Once that movie came out, all the sports fishermen, that's all they want to do is catch sharks. Yeah. Now, people are crying because almost all the sharks are dead. I don't know why they're crying about that. <laughs> Jesus, a go. giant fish with teeth that'll eat you is no longer around. <laughs> Sounds like a win-win for me. Expanded perspectives, yahoo.com. That's going to be attention, Kyle. <laughs> Well, like we complain about wasps. Sunday at the baseball tournament, poor trip on our team. 12-year-old third baseman, he's really good. He got stung three times by wasps in the middle of the ball game. They just like descended upon him, started stinging him, and then flew off. <laughs> descended. I don't know if he, the kid was bad at home. He seems like a sweet kid. I'm like, what are wasps good for? It was the plague hit him. Nothing. And I and I want to also, also want to yeah, go. Sorry. It's, it's not also, I'm not hating on the acting in this, in the second movie the second it the acting is great like bill my Hader wife enjoyed it but she said great she said it's inappropriate so do not oh, take yeah, it's children. inappropriate but i mean i'm inappropriate i go yeah all the acting was great it's just i had a problem and i'm not even having a problem with scars guard that was playing it he did a great job it's just the way or playing pennywise rather it's just the way that they used it i just wasn't happy of course who am i i mean i'm nobody it's just something I would still tell you to go see it. I mean, if you've seen the first one, you kind of have to see the second one. Yeah, I mean, if it's you're just a fan the way of it is. You know, yeah. Pennywise. You've got to check it all out. But I do. I just, all these horror movies. Great band, by the way. Pennywise is a fantastic band. Here we go. I thought you liked Silverchair. No, I did back in 1993. You did two weeks ago. I don't know what your problem is. I don't think is. they're even alive anymore. Yeah, the kid's <laughs> just not 15 anymore. <laughs> no, now he's like 44. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't, I, I guess it's. Like, what's your favorite? Do you have a go-to Halloween movie? Hmm. Because I, I have a go-to Christmas movie that I watch that's one of my favorites to watch, which is Die Hard. No, Die Hard's an excellent Christmas film. If I have to say Halloween, yes. um, boy, that's a tough one. I would probably say Halloween 3, Season of the Witch, because it has nothing to do with Michael Myers. It's just somewhere in the middle. Where the masks are going. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. I, and then the, the, the next Halloween is right back to Michael Myers. I don't know where... In the middle of that, they just kept the same title, but the movie had nothing to do with it. It's like you were watching a whole movie and then just all of a sudden went on an acid trip and then come back and was like, oh, yeah, I forgot what I was supposed to be writing about and then went back into it. Yeah, like this is Wizard of Oz 2 and then this movie's just about a car salesman who has a real hard time finding a girlfriend. <laughs> and then goes right back into the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of, since it's close, shout out to Mr. Rest in Peace, uh, uh, Captain Spaulding, Mr. Sid Haig. Yeah, I saw that. Man, I've been following him on Instagram and all that stuff and I know that he'd been sick off and on and so much so that they had to shut down their uh, uh, selling all of his stuff. You know, he was like selling a bunch of shirts yeah, and a bunch of yeah. merch and he had gotten sick and they had gotten behind. So, he, you know, he had taken on on a social media and said, hey, look, we're going to close it till we get everything caught up. You know, I'm trying to rebound and all this. And next thing you know, he passes, yeah. which bums out because, man, Captain Spaulding, man, he's been a bunch of older, great, like 70s horror movies and even good movies. But Captain Spaulding was my favorite character that he had done. Yeah. Uh, that, you know what? And I was like we talked about House of a Thousand Corpses. Yeah, it was OK. I liked it. I, I it, was it was all right. I like The Devil's Rejects. Yeah, The Devil's Rejects. Once again, because unlike a movie about an alien or a werewolf, I mean, just some rabid, murderous people yeah. is a reality. That's like a normal day in Liberia. <laughs> probably, yes. Like a probably. normal day. <laughs> yeah. You're you just, probably right. You drive into a town and the people cut your head off. Other people kill you. You don't know what's going to happen. They blow you up. They yeah. stab a big pike through you and post you up like a coyote. That's yeah. a normal day. And you know I what know, I see early on. I don't know. <laughs> uh, I like Rob Zombie's version of Halloween. Does he not have a new movie coming out? I thought it was. Is it called Hell's Three or something like that? Where it's it's those three again? I, I'm, I think so because I've seen uh, lately he's been appearing on a lot of shows and that normally yeah. when that happens someone's releasing something. But I, I you know now that I'm thinking about it, I don't know you know what movie used to scare the hell out of me when I was a kid? What's that? Something Wicked This Way Comes. I remember that. With like the carnival and then the dude, that, you know, that ran the carnival. I think, wasn't he the same guy that did that? Wasn't he the same creepy guy in uh, The Golden Child? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's Tyrion, uh, Tywin Lannister. 
It's in the yeah, Golden Child. Yeah, I liked uh, Rawhead Rex. So the guy's like, baptize me. Oh, I forgot about that. The thing was urinating on yeah, it. Yeah, whatever stuff. that Rawhead Rex. Yeah, or the Evil Dead. You know, that was that was creepy too. Yeah, the original. You know, where the yeah, it used to freak me out. But yeah, I just I don't know. There's something about today's horror movies. Is it maybe it's because I don't really watch them that much. I guess it's because I'm older. But I did watch, and I was telling Kyle, and I know I'm late to the party because my daughter's been making fun of me. I finally watched The Haunting of Hill House on Netflix. I'm a fan, bro. You need to check it out. I have not seen that. I know my wife has. You need to check it out. Well, I got something else I bet you haven't seen, even though you've been here a bunch. Okay. Folks, this comes from Cryptozoology News. Yes. New Jersey man claims he saw a young Bigfeets. Oh. This is a fella in Burlington County. A Sasquirt. That's exactly what he saw. Mike. Mike, of course, didn't provide his last name, but he was talking to the BFRO, and he says, hey, man. I was driving my my truck southward on Chatsworth, or southward of Chatsworth, rather, on June 20th of 2019, he said, when he noticed this odd creature. He said it was approximately 6.40 p.m. At first, I thought it was a big, get a load of this, big groundhog. <laughs> but then I saw a three-foot-tall creature stand up on two legs. Now, he says he since, of course, he didn't get initial good look at it. He said, so he decided, I'm going to turn around, which, you know, congrats. Good job, Mike. Thought it was a groundhog. Then he sees this thing stand up. He's like, I'm not sure what that was. I'm going to bust a Yui. He said, I pulled in and turned around and headed back to the location. Said, now there's a bend in the road there. It bends around to the right on the way back as I made it past the bend. Approximately 30 yards in front of me, this creature was still there. Now he adds this time that he could perfectly see what he was looking at. Now this guy's description is impeccable. Please. It looked like a mix between Curious George and the character Chaka from The Land of the Lost, he explained, (laughs) adding that its face and top of the feet were hairless and of a light tan color. The fur, he recalls, was golden brown but darker than a golden retriever. I could not see the nose. I locked eyes with it and didn't notice any white in them, only big dark brown eyes. Now, that's when the alleged creature reportedly fled into the woods and Mike couldn't spot it any longer. Now, he says he waited a few days before telling his family and friends about this. He said, I thought for sure someone was going to report a missing kid in a costume. Now, of course, he spoke to Eric Spinner, which is a BFRO investigator, for almost an hour. And then, of course, they met up after this. And he says he interviewed the witness and later met at this sighting area. And Eric said that I found Mike to be a credible witness And that was very clear with his reporting of the events. And he had previously had not been into the Bigfoot phenom at all. Said he hadn't even seen an episode of Finding Bigfoot. So this guy could not care any less about Bigfoot. Sees a three foot tall, curious George slash Chaka. (laughs) And I'm laughing because I've thought of the movie, the remake of that movie. Which is funny. Danny McBride or whatever. (laughs) Yes. Which is funny. (laughs) Look, yeah. that that's that was a remake that I enjoyed. Yeah, me too. If you, uh, have you been watching the new uh, Righteous Gemstones on yes, HBO? Yes, I have. Yes, that's yes, good. I have. That's a it's good. good. That's a, but okay, so he thought it was a groundhog. Hats off to him for instantly rationalizing. I thought it was a groundhog stood up. Of course, I've never seen a groundhog in person. I've seen dudes holding like pucks of tawny Phil, you know, and they're pretty good sized. So I imagine when they like. Isn't that a groundhog that stands up in those memes and they've got the voice yelling or something? What is it? I think that's a meerkat. Not a. That's not a meerkat. This thing's in in the America. I saw some. Uh, the only ones I've seen is like long range, high powered rifle videos. <laughs> I have, have seen to do those. with groundhogs. Yes, I've seen those prairie like, dogs too. Yeah, and like up in the rocks and they're just dusting them uh-huh. off. But a three footer, three foot's pretty good size. Oh yeah. But for three foot to be a a hairy, two legged like bipedal hominid. At three, I would, man, I don't know how. If I saw something like that, I would definitely bust a you. You would have like, to turn around because instantly you're like, is that a child? Yeah, right? what's Just going real quick, on? is that a kid like playing? Like, what's he doing out here? What's she doing out here? Like, we've got to turn around and go find out. And then you get back and this thing's standing there staring at you. And it's, but what was it doing on the side of the road? Probably plinking rocks playing like a kid would play. Yeah, I don't know. So um, but, so we've got a, a Chaka sighting. Yeah. I mean, New Jersey is heavily wooded down there, especially in the south of Jersey, like down in the Pine Barrens and stuff. I mean, it's thick. Like I'm talking thicker 50, than a bowl of oatmeal. Fifty yards off the side of the road, you can't see nothing. That's how thick. I wonder if there's a lot. I need to look into that to see if there's more sightings of like these 
Like if, what if there is, here's, we go with the what ifs. Think about this. What if there is a species of Bigfoot that that's as big as they get? Why not? There's the orang pendic. Right. Which they found is about three foot tall. Wouldn't it be easier to hide? That they they know existed. Yeah. Like 12,000, 10,000 years yeah. ago. Wouldn't it be easier to hide? I would think so. Like if you were small like that and you could be easily misidentified. Man, I, I don't know. I'm going to have to look in to see if I can find any. Of course, we call them Bigfoot, but I think that's, I wish there was another name for them. There's lots of names. I, for I mean, them. I understand they call Sasquatch and all that stuff, but I don't know. Like, the, was the skunk ape supposed to be in Florida? Things like that. Like, because when you think of Bigfoot, I think of one that's three foot tall and a foot that's like 16, 18 inches long. <laughs> I know what you're saying, though. It's like people all rope it into one thing. So, yeah. like, in, you know, the Bigfoot is a Bigfoot. When I think that you're quite right. There could be several different species of hairy hominid. Yes. There could be small ones. There can be gigantic ones. Because you tell people, hear people telling stories up in like British Columbia where the things are like 10 foot easily, they always say. Yeah. I don't know. Pretty strange. But speaking of strange, this person thinks they were being watched. Cam, get this by MIBs. Oh, no. It says, one day my two friends and I were out late on the levee in Stockton, California. What's up, 209? And we saw a bright star. It looked like a star anyways. Orbiting the sky very fast. As we watched, it stopped in midair. Then five more stars appeared around it. That's when we realized these weren't stars. They were lights lit up on what looked like a UFO. And that's when we started panicking. But then the UFO turned into a white cloud, then pink, then blood red, and it vanished into thin air. We literally ran out of that levee, and I went to hang out with my best friend, and I told her everything. I thought it would be just a memory at that point, so I went home, and I went to sleep. I woke up the next morning with my doorbell ringing, very early, and when I went to look, I saw a man in a black suit with a briefcase standing at my front door. I thought he was just someone trying to sell me something. I just was annoyed at that point. It was so early. Now the guy woke me up. So I waited until he left. Well, at least that's what I thought planned to do, but he wouldn't leave. He was just staring into my house like a mannequin for like five minutes straight, not moving a muscle. I wanted to see if he had a car, but when I looked out another window, I noticed that there were five more of men dressed like he was outside of my house all just staring at my house blankly. My heart skipped a beat at this point. I was so freaked out. So I was for sure dialing the police at this point. But as soon as I started dialing my phone, they all looked at me at the exact same second. I don't even know how they saw me through the little crack in the fence that I was watching them from. They stared at me coldly, for a few moments. Then again, at the exact same time, they walked away and got into their car. They all watched me, even the driver, as he was driving away. I never spoke of it since. This is real, and it's terrifying. Ever since then, I always feel like I'm only safe in my room with my windows closed and all of my doors locked. I feel like they're still watching my house. OD. No, thank you. That's crazy, right? Yeah. So, you know, out there in Stockton, maybe training with the Diaz brothers, maybe. Little Gilbert Melendez, Jay representing Shields. the 209. That's right. And uh, they see some strange lights they think was a satellite moving around the sky. Turns out uh, it's a UFO. And then the next day, odd looking men uh, are at his front door. Uh, this is, I mean, listen, it sounds crazy, but off air, Nick Redfern told me that he had an experience with something that he looked or it looked very similar to the same descriptions as an MIB. He doesn't know. It could have been just an odd-looking fellow. Mm -hmm. But there are people that have these these claims. You know, now, I know Nick never saw a UFO or anything, but it's just odd when it comes to the speaking out about UFOs, to writing about UFOs, to blogging, perhaps podcasting. I've never had an experience. I'm so dumb if a bald-looking MIB asked me a question, I'd probably just answer it, move on, <laughs> just and not cruising. even think about it. 
right? Slightly annoyed that he stopped you to talk. I'm slightly annoyed when anybody stops to talk with me. <laughs> and that's one of my worst things. You go measure a house, and the old man's like, "Can I help you?" You're like, "Oh no, it's okay. I got it." Then they help you anyways. I'm like, "Well, why did you ask?" <laughs> right? Like my wife. <laughs> what do you want for dinner? Oh, I don't care. What do you want? Oh, I don't care. And then you like recommend something? No, nah, I don't want that. Okay, well, how about this? No, nah, I don't want that. Well, then you just decide because obviously you care. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's ridiculous. But she doesn't have great taste. Look who she married. That's anyway, we're going to jump back into upright canines. <laughs> All right, let's do it. <laughs> let's do it. This comes, of course, Lon had this posted up, and I can't get away from any dog man sightings. I, I just, love them. Especially, especially this time of year. Exactly. That's my whole thing, especially this time of year. Werewolf sightings. I'm going to start. There are no more upright canines. They're werewolves. That's it. Let's just call it what it is. It's a werewolf. This comes from Pentwater, Michigan. Uh, this person, D.E., writes in and says, I had stayed at my friend's place by Lansing for a couple of weeks and decided to take off and head towards the shore of Lake Michigan, up through uh, Petoskey and over to the U.P. It was dark by the time I got to Pentwater, a small resort town on the shore of Lake Michigan in the western part of the state. I was kind of confused at a stop sign and lurched to a stop, started and stopped. I looked up, so I guess they were just kind of looking around which way to turn, which way to go, kind of starting and stopped and said, I looked up and there was a police officer stopped to my right. So I decided to make a right turn, then turn into a neighborhood. I made my way back to the main road and took a right. As I turned back onto the main road, I saw a small hill going up into a wooded area on the left. And I saw some sort of animal in the grassy area between the road and the trees. I thought to myself, oh, cool. I'm going to see some wildlife like a possum or a badger or something. <laughs> right. But as I got near it, it seemed to move in a very unnatural way for an animal like that. Sort of too fast and too jerky as it ran to the side and then down the hill. It appeared to be brown and reddish tobacco colored and furry. It looked much larger too, more like human size. As, after I passed it, now this is the part that gets me. After I passed it, I looked up in my rear view mirror. The animal had stood up on its hind legs and ran across the street, leaning over with its front arms hanging down. A classic werewolf type horror movie pose. I had been planning on camping out in that area, but no way. I drove over two hours before I stopped. Jeez. So it uh, D E noticed something strange. Uh yeah. And then was like, I don't know what this drove by, looks in the rear view mirror, and the thing stands up, a werewolf. A werewolf and mind you. runs across the road behind him. Now I guess easily you could say, you know, and, and, and here's the thing. It's not telling us exactly when this went down. There's no exact date, right? So we don't know if this just happened or when it was, but let's assume it just happened. It could easily have been someone in a costume messing around. Sure. You know, at this time of year, people like to do that stuff. But I will say this. I've got some friends, uh, online friends, that uh, live up around the Lake Michigan and all up in that area, too. It's deer season up there, too. You don't want to be acting a fool in the woods. Just people only think that there's only rednecks where they live. They're all over this great country of ours, folks. So you run around in the woods dressed up acting a fool. You're taking your life into your own hands anywhere you go. Well, there was a, that case from a couple of years ago where the guy was dressed up as Sasquatch, tried to jump out and scare these girls. They ran over him with the car and Smoked killed him. him. Smoked him. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah, if you want to try to play a prank on somebody, I mean, by all means you can, but you're putting your life at risk. Yeah, you don't. It's you don't want to do that. So that's another thing. I think most people know that also. Like if you're going to play a prank on someone dressed up, you would probably want to do it like late at night in the city, like around like a park or something, you know, where you would get somebody driving by. But more than likely, you don't want to be out in the wooded area. And, and of course, now they're talking about there's a wooded area goes up into the trees. Man, you're if it's somebody making a joke, that's why it makes me think it's not a joke. Like, what is it that they saw? I, a werewolf run across the road. That's what it sounds like. Well, let's take a break, folks. When we get back from the break, I'm going to be talking about the tragic lives of some people who were stranded on what is known as Nazino Island. Stick with us, folks. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives.
we as a species have come a long, long way in the last 200,000 years or so. From those very first days of living in caves, just trying to survive, without being killed by a large assortment of possible scenarios. We learned how to make and use stone tools, and not just make them, but to refine them into specific tasks. Things like fish hooks, harpoons, bows and arrows, atlatls, spears, and yes, even sewing needles. For millions of years, all humans, early and modern alike, had to find their own food. They spent a large part of each day gathering plants and hunting or scavenging animals. By 164,000 years ago, modern humans were collecting and cooking shellfish. And by 90,000 years ago, modern humans had begun making special fishing tools. Then, within just the past 12,000 years, our species, Homo sapiens, made the transition to producing food and changing our surroundings. Humans found that they could control the growth and breeding of certain plants and animals. This discovery led to farming and herding animals, activities that transformed Earth's natural landscapes, first locally and then globally. As humans invested more time in producing food, they began to settle down. Villages became towns, towns became cities. With more food available, the human population began to increase dramatically. Our species had been so successful that it had inadvertently created a turning point in the history of life on Earth. As time moved on, we've created some amazing things, like the ability to fly, not just here on Earth, but to the moon, even other planets. Think about all of our modern advances, our cars, our homes, our computers, medicine, healthcare, diet, exercise, hell, even the advanced object you're listening to this podcast on. Our phones are better than the communicator they used on the show Star Trek. You can now FaceTime each other anywhere on the globe that gets a signal and talk to a loved one or friend. Explaining this type of technology to someone only a few generations back would be unimaginable. I only bring all of this up because us modern humans, who are lucky enough to live in this time, right here, right now, in our modern cities, we've forgotten our past. We've become soft as a species. In our comfortable, civilized society, it is very easy to lose sight of the fact that beneath all of our accomplishments, there resides the primal, the bestial drive to survive by any means necessary. And all of our base instincts are absolutely no different than the fiercest animals that share this world with us. We are animals. How much or little would it take for you to relapse into our once more primal abilities? What is the breaking point that reverts us from man to beast? For thousands of prisoners without hope in the frigid wilds of Russia, the answers to these questions would become all too clear as they spun down the road to our basic nature. Survival at any cost. These were the prisoners of what would become known as the notorious Cannibal Island, a terrible place that forced them to do what they had to do, even if that meant eating each other's flesh. This event all started back in 1933 in the former Soviet Union. At this time, Stalin's brutal regime was in the midst of a diabolical plan originally thought up by Zhenrik Yagoda, who was at the time head of the Joint State Political Directorate, which was basically the Soviet secret police force. The grand plan was envisioned as sending up to two million of society's undesirables to the desolate wastelands of Siberia and Kazakhstan in order to set up what was termed special settlements and which most of us today know as the notorious gulags. The plan was that within two years, these settlements 
full of their labor colonists, would be able to tame these wild, untouched lands and manage a state of self-sufficiency, moving them out of the cities and having them successfully populate the most remote and inhospitable regions. The idea was that these people could inhabit these regions and live on their own. This would clean up Soviet cities of their more unsavory, unwanted guests that were essentially considered parasites feeding off of civilized society. These undesirables that were to be sent were mostly the homeless, beggars, petty criminals, gypsies, the mentally handicapped, and the insane. More or less, anyone who didn't fit into the ideals of the communist class structure. Some people were gathered up for almost nothing but some trumped-up charge, like not having the proper paperwork or even a passport. They were added to this list of people to be shipped to live in the new settlements deep within the taiga forests. By April of 1933, 25,000 people had been rounded up and loaded into stinking, cramped trains to be sent off into the far corners of the frigid wilderness. And they were to pass through a transit camp at the remote Siberian region of Tomsk on the way. Perhaps you've seen similar images in World War II documentaries or movies of the Germans loading up and packing European Jews into train cars to be shipped to extermination camps like Auschwitz or Treblinka. The trip was a harrowing one, with very little food or water to go around, which caused the rise of gangs who beat or killed other prisoners to steal their food and their belongings. Once they arrived at Tomsk, things did not get any better. They had arrived a few days before they were expected to, and the Tomsk authorities had been given very short notice in the first place, meaning they were poorly equipped to deal with the deluge of prisoners that were now pouring in. There simply was not enough food. There was not nearly enough water, and there was not any medicine to go around, and furthermore, the Tomsk authorities viewed the urban prisoners as wretched, diseased, and dangerous. Not surprisingly, many of the prisoners perished during the whole ordeal. But considering what was to happen next, they were probably among the lucky ones. In an effort to take pressure off the limited available resources and to relieve the strain of the overcrowded camp, around 6,000 of the bedraggled prisoners were chosen to be moved to another temporary camp until it could be figured out just what the hell to do with them. Four river barges, typically used for hauling wood, were hastily refurbished into prison vessels, and the mass of freezing, starving prisoners were crammed aboard to be brought to an isolated speck of land surrounded on both sides by rivers. This land, or island, was around two miles long and about 656 yards wide, and it was located 500 miles away by the name of Nazino Island. Conditions aboard the barges were even worse than they had been aboard the train cars, with prisoners kept stuffed below decks to wallow in their own filth and allocated to a meager 200 grams of rotting bread per person a day on which to live on. There was no other food aboard the barges, no cooking utensils, nor any extra clothing, and very little water. Even the guards accompanying the prisoners were new recruits who didn't even have uniforms and in some cases were without shoes. By the time the barges reached Nazino Island, 27 of the prisoners had already died due to the horde conditions and around a third of the rest barely had enough strength to even stand. Things quickly went from bad to worse when it was found that their new home was a frigid wasteland of thorny brush bereft of any natural food or sources, and a further 300 prisoners died in a snowstorm on the very first night as they slept out in the open without any blankets or shelter. <laughs> there was nothing there. I mean nothing. No town, 
no village, no food. They expected to create their own town, but but how were they going to do that? The prisoners were abandoned there and left to fend for themselves. Without supplies, without tools, cooking utensils, and only a few guards who were practically as haggard as they were to preserve order. The only thing they were left with, get this, was around 20 tons of moldy flour, which was dumped onto the shore of the island, and then was to be distributed equally. But, as you could imagine, things rather quickly devolved into chaos when the starving prisoners converged upon the flour in a churning. A disorderly stampede, which quickly turned into brawls and rioting. The panicked guards ended up firing into this crowd of people in a mad dash to get food, leaving many of them dead or wounded severely. For those who were able to secure flour for themselves, their troubles were only starting. Since there were no ovens or equipment with which to actually make bread and very little water to be had, not even any containers to put it in, most people resorted to mixing the flour with dirty, disease-infested river water and just eating it raw, which led to rampant dysentery and even typhoid. Realizing they were facing sure doom on the island if they stayed, a few of the prisoners tried to make a break for freedom aboard jerry-rigged makeshift rafts, which didn't go very well at all. Some of these escapees were shot by a ragtag group of guards stationed on the island, while others drowned when their rafts disintegrated beneath their feet in the rough waters of the river. Those who actually managed to get out would have soon seen how misguided their plans were, since the only thing to be found downstream was vast expanses of frozen Siberian taiga, and there were no roads leading to civilization for hundreds of miles. In fact, the nearest settlement of any size was hundreds of miles upstream at Tomsk, which was where they had come from in the first place. The handful of people who got away were quickly deemed to be doomed to die out in the Siberian badlands. Within a few more days of arriving on Nazino Island, dozens more had already died. People were now getting desperate. They certainly knew their own government had shipped them up there to die. But what to do now? For some, the will to live meant they would have to do whatever it takes to stay alive. It was at this point they changed. Back into the animalistic mindset we all have deep down inside of us, but only a few of us are willing to go to. With many of the bodies just lying out in the open, it wasn't long before the starving masses of people began to resort to feeding off the flesh of those who had already fallen. It became a common sight to see dead bodies that had been cut up as if by a butcher, stripped of the best pieces of flesh and missing nourishing organs such as the heart or liver. It was not long after that that the prisoners began to graduate to cannibalistic murder. They began to hunt each other down for food as if they were animals. Roving gangs of people, crazed from hunger, fanned out and terrorized the sick or weak, brutally slaying them and consuming their flesh raw. In one particular disturbing account, a young woman was allegedly captured and tied to a tree, where bloodthirsty cannibals stripped her of meat while she was still alive, writhing in agony. Just like a scene from The Walking Dead or George Romero's Day of the Dead, it must have looked like a zombie apocalypse. Man, for those unfortunate souls, it was an apocalypse, an event involving destruction or damage on an awesome or catastrophic scale. A common practice among prisoners was called bleeding the cow, in which a group would lure in another prisoner by inviting them to join them in an escape attempt, only to brutally kill and butcher them for their meat when they finally got the person alone. The few guards that were stationed on the island were of little 
or no use when it came to keeping the prisoners in check or from protecting the victims of the vicious attacks. Not only were the guards undisciplined and corrupt, with many of them extorting the prisoners on a regular basis, but they were also mostly just as starved and disheveled as any of the prisoners they were sent to watch over. One official claimed that the Nazino's guards were in no way distinguished from the unlikable elements they were supposed to monitor. Many years later, one survivor of the ordeal, then in her 80s, who arrived at Nazino Island as a 13-year-old girl would say, The things we saw. People were dying everywhere. They were killing each other. When you went along the island, you saw human flesh wrapped in rags. Human flesh that had been cut and hung in the trees. The fields were full of corpses. Unbelievably, the Soviet government either did not know or did not care about how out of hand things had become and continued to send shipments of even more prisoners to the island with a further 1,200 arriving on May 27th to face the hardship of this untamed land and its marauding cannibalistic hordes. I think the government did know. I just think they didn't care. This was a way to clean up the streets of riffraff and undesirables. It is said that some of the new arrivals were savagely attacked and ravaged for their meat, practically upon stepping off the boats. Imagine approaching this zombie-like appearance of an island in the middle of nowhere, where you were instantly attacked, killed, and feasted upon your arrival. What must have went through their brains? As the savage bloodshed got worse and more people died, the government began to realize the gravity of the situation and became concerned that some of the blood-crazed prisoners on this island might actually make their way to other remote villages in the region. You know, they might run amok, terrorizing other people who live there or to tell others of their plight and what they were subjected to. Either way, reinforcements were sent into Nazino to aid the outnumbered under-equipped guards that were already there, and dozens of prisoners were arrested for cannibalism. But it was too little, too late. By the time the camp was totally shut down, just one month after it had started, it is estimated that 4,000 of the initial 6,000 people brought here had died, many of them violently. Although the true death toll will likely forever remain unknown, as many of the prisoners lacked any sort of proper documentation. At the time, the Regional Committee of the Communist Party of Western Siberia launched a commission to look into what happened at Nazino Island, but the report was promptly buried and kept under wraps, just had been done with other similar accounts of the grim life and horrific atrocities of Siberia's gulags. You have to remember... After all, this was the Soviet Union. It was common practice at the time to suppress this sort of information, and anyone like a reporter who wrote about the gulags or even spread rumors about them did it at the risk of being sent to one themselves or just being killed outright. For decades, the government denied and covered up what had transpired at Nazino until the truth started to become known in 1988 due to the efforts of a Russian historical and civil rights society called Memorial, which gradually tracked down these top secret documents and made them known to the outside world. Yet, even then, many Western publications mostly turned a blind eye to the problem. The trickle of information was also very slow, and the actual commission report on Nazino Island made by the Soviet government in 1933, was not published until 2002. Also, because of the efforts of Memorial, in more recent years, the horrific truth of what happened on Nazino Island has further been slowly revealed through dedicated work from organizations such as Memorial, as well as the work of authors such as French historian Nicholas Wirth, 
who spent years meticulously digging through lost archives and documents for information that would culminate in his extremely in-depth book on the affair titled Cannibal Island, which was published in 2006. The story of Nazino Island is far from the only tale of barbaric brutality, of what lengths a government will go to, to cleanse its culture from those it sees as unwelcome or undesirable. It's a story to me that shows us what we are capable of, at least some of us. The fact that deep down inside all of us, we are nothing more than animals, with the same biological needs that every mammal on earth needs. And if pushed or cornered, we will fight back, whether physically or the boundaries of social constructionism. When I think about people being pushed, I think about people being really pushed, not like a Navy SEAL or an Olympian. No, I think of people who are pushed to the very limits of what makes us human. I think about of the men on the Lost Franklin expedition aboard the HMS Erebus and the HMS Terror, or perhaps the Donner Party, or even better, the Bataan Death March. I think of people who are pushed beyond what we think is capable. People who literally look and behave like an animal. You're listening to Expanded Perspectives. back with expanded perspectives yeah man nazino island also known as stalin's cannibal island remind me not to book a trip there uh yeah well first of all it's way up in siberia <laughs> in the taiga and uh would you go there if you had the opportunity to i go think to i taiga? would yes i, I would mean, love i think to it would be there. awesome yeah um you know just to see that part of the world that how remote it is so much of the world is populated that uh it would be very cool to go and see yeah. that part of the world. But what a tragic story. I mean, this is a case where you, know, you only hear about the Germans enslaving and exterminating uh, the Jews and all these people. But it looks like the Russians were kind of doing a similar thing where they had gathered up all the riffraff, shipped them up to this island. They claimed they were then a hope that they would settle the area, create villages and towns for themselves. But I think way back in their mind, they knew that they weren't setting these people up. They were setting them up for failure. The people were stranded on this island and... With no supplies, no food, much like in that show, The Terror, we were talking mm -hmm. about. Uh, they started cannibalizing on people. But they literally had no choice. The people were dying. You were starving to death. I mean, you know, people will do incredible things yeah. when pushed to. That's why I talked about in the segment how it reminds me of the Franklin expedition. It reminds me of the Donner Party. It reminds me of the death, uh, the Bataan Death March. Like all these things where p human beings are literally pushed to their limits and what people, some people are forced to do. Mm -hmm. The animalistic part of you takes over. You no longer become, or you're no longer the, uh, the human that you are in everyday society. You know what it makes me think of? What's that? You ever seen the very first Jack Reacher? Yeah. You remember the prisoner that's in there, the, the bad guy in it that's got like no fingers? Uh-huh. That's what it makes me think of. Yeah. 
Yeah. It's right. like you told me, like, people will do anything. All right. How about the guy that was hiking and fell in that crevasse and had to, like, cut his own knife, arm off oh. with, like, a butter knife or something? And, was it 127 hours? Isn't yeah, that what it's called? Yeah, something like that. I mean, the fact that you could, I mean, sitting here now, you're like, I could not do it. But if you're in that situation, like I said, if you're stranded and you're starving, there's no telling what you'd do to survive. Yeah, it's true. And if these, I mean, what's scary is once they started doing it, then it turned. It's like they all turned a corner and then they just started. It was a free for all. They were killing each other. Yeah. Left and right. Like, once I'm not starts, waiting for Bob to drop dead. Then I'll eat him. Bob's dropping dead now. I'm just going to go ahead now. and kill him now. <laughs> yeah. Bob's dropping dead <laughs> now. Uh, what a horrible thing. Um, On the show, before we get out of here, something kind of cool. When you think something you might want to give th thought about is we talk about our ancestors all the time and how mean you want to get our mm -hmm. 23 and me, our ancestry.com or whatever, where they do the DNA test and you can find out where you're from, what your ancestors were like, uh, future health problems, things like that. But when you think about your ancestors, what's cool is how the numbers, if you start thinking about your ancestors, how the numbers compound and how many people it actually has taken to make you who you are. Listening to the show, Cam, who you are, who I am. Like how big so your family how actually is. How many ancestors? Okay, so I'm just going to ask you how many ancestors do you think that you would have if you go back 20 generations? 20 generations? Yeah. So great, 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 great. Share great, DNA great, with me. Like your direct lineage. So, like you're each talking person, about, like, like, say, five or six or seventh great grandparent. With the 20, no, 20, your 20th great grandparent, my 20th great grandparent, starting there, and all of their siblings, because I'd be c directly connected to them. Uh huh. And then it, it would probably be a hundred thousand or more. It's probably going to blow your mind. So each person, with exceptionally few cases, has two biological parents, right? Each person. Mm -hmm. And each par person's parents also had two parents, mm -hmm. and their grandparents have two parents, and so on and so on and so on. This means that each generation that you go back into your family tree, the number of ancestors you has doubles, mm -hmm. right? So now assuming the example, for this example only, the average age of 25 years per generation, meaning each generation had a child around the age of 25 years old, give or take. Yes. That's a safe number. Of course, it could vary, right? So to go back 20 generations, they say it would take about 500 years. And so check out how this accumulates. So you have two parents. So the cumulative number of people is two. Mm -hmm. Now your grandparents, you would have four, right? Two from each one of your parents. So now the cumulative number is six. Your That's four right. grandparents plus your two parents. Great grandparents, you would have eight. So now your cumulative number is 14. Your great great grandparents, now you have 16. The cumulative number now is up to 30 people that have made you who you are. Direct lineage. Now if you keep going back 20 generations, you have, and everyone listen to this show, you have 1,048,576 grandparents, or for the cumulative number of ancestors, you would have 2,097,150 ancestors to make you who you are listening to this show. Wow. So that's, there's that's no crazy. wonder, like when you get your DNA run, that you, you find out that you may have distant relatives that you know nothing about. Because you got to think about that 2,500 years ago. There was way fewer people. Yeah. So, way fewer people. So 500 years ago isn't really that long of a time either. When you think about 500 it. 500 years ago, what we're bumping in on 1492. Yeah. So, I mean, we, we, wow. Yeah, there was way fewer people. So it's no surprise that, man. They said it would take fi about 500 years to make 20 generations with the average age being yeah. like 25. Yeah. But you it, you don't think about it being a number that big. It, for some reason in your mind, you think about, oh, well, my grandma, she's 100 or almost 100 years old. So you think about like five generations back because yeah. all your thinking took place in that time. But there's way more than that. And the number compounds. Well, then you start thinking also like you're talking about like aunts and uncles and then great aunts and uncles and then great, great, great aunts and uncles and then their children and then their children's children. Because you're, you're direct descendant to all of those people. Yeah. Gee, I thought a hundred thousand was going to be a massively overshot number. It wasn't even close. It's one percent. Yeah, and you can Google it yourself if you don't believe me. Um, I'll put links to it in the show notes as well. But isn't that, that is crazy? Crazy that twenty-one generations ago, 
I mean, basically 2 million people it's taken of breeding to produce you. No pressure. Just don't let them down. So, I mean, that must have been a <laughs> lot of, you know, people with bad genetics. For me, especially. I feel like all the bad genetics got saved up which, till me. Which is another thing, which is like, if you think about it. Yeah. When these people that are like super racist or whatever, that's a ridiculous argument because you know how many people you think all whatever, you know, whatever race you're a fan oh, yeah. of. Like you think you're pure blood? There's right there. Do you think like you're, you're pure crazy? blood for two million people? That's ridiculous. N yeah, exactly. So you're arguing about <laughs> you're, it's yeah. nonsense. It's, it's a, nonsense. It's, yeah. Anyway, it's pretty interesting. That's math, folks. Yeah. I, well, I've got something that's not quite as mathematical, but I'm going to lay this on you. Uh, we always talk about how some wild stuff happens to us. One of the, I, I was telling the story the other day to some guys that I trained with and was eating dinner with my coach and a bunch of us, a bunch of jujitsu guys. And I was telling them the story about Bob Lazar, right? And about the, uh, the documentary, because they'd asked me if I'd seen any cool movies or whatnot. So I was like, man, I'll tell you something y'all all need to watch. You need to check out this documentary. And then I don't think I've told this before on the show. I don't think so. And th this happened a while back, I'd say probably a month ago, close to a month ago. And one of the guys I was training with was like, wait, wait, when did you say this took place? So I told him, you know, when this had taken place. And he was, and I go, why? And this fellow that I'm going to tell you is in the military right now. And uh, that in fact actually runs in their family. His father was in the military also. And he goes, well, it's weird. He goes, my father was in the air force and and he told me, and this is the, the guy telling me this, said his father had told him a story that he actually had got to fly into Area 51 several times. Mm. And that he flew a, I forgot what kind of plane it was that he told me, some kind of fancy name, but it was basically a plane that was made for radar. So it's not like one of the weather planes, right? Like it's an actual plane that they flew that would, I guess, I don't know if it was, I know his father flew in combat missions, but I'm not really sure what this plane was, what he called it for. But anyway, him and another, another plane, another guy had landed. So this buddy of mine's dad, this training partner's dad and his dad's friend had landed at area 51. And they were told on radio before they landed, they said, you have to wait till we get all the windows blacked out where you can't when you land, you can't see anything. So wait till we give you the green light. So they circled till they physically blacked all the windows out so they could land where they would, couldn't even see what was in the buildings, even just landing on the runway. Now, he said they landed on the runway and they were told, point your planes in another direction. So they had to point their planes in a certain direction and then taxi those down to the certain part of the runway. And he said, now I want you to run your radar. So they weren't even flying at this point. Oh, I got you. They were, they on, the were on the tarmac shooting radar. He said, we need to see if you can pick these things up, these things. And he said that they saw one blip and then nothing. And he said they spent several hours doing these exercises, trying to pick up this certain thing that the, that area 51 was flying low altitude around, uh, the, the base. Right. He never really, I don't think he ever told me if they got airborne, if they took airborne. They may have gotten airborne if later on, but he was like, they tried for quite, and, and apparently this went on for over a week. That's what their job was to go and land and do all this radar stuff. I think they did do, do a few flying runs. I think they were flying like north and south or something, scanning these areas and trying to pick up these, whatever this object was that they said, we need to see if you can pick this up on radar. And he he finished the story telling me about his dad. And I was like, dude, that's at the exact same time, 88, 89. That's at the exact same time of what Bob says was going on. And these are the things I'm like, maybe your dad was involved in trying to radar, like acknowledge one of these craft while we were flying it. Like Bob talks about, like, yeah, there it is. Maybe. And I mean, it could be, I mean, yeah. devil's advocate. It could be just a top secret it could military be nothing plane. Else. Exactly. But it's in the same timeline. In the same place, everything falls into place. And then he said, he goes, well, my dad said there was a lot more to some of these other stories that he would like to share, but they're still classified. His dad's been out of the military for quite some time and still says, I cannot share any of that information, even with his son. It's like, I cannot share that with you. That, but that's crazy. I'm going to get to go on a fishing trip with him. Oh, yeah. When are you doing that? I think we're going to do it after the first of the year. I hope we're, we've talked about it when his dad comes up. We may, because his dad lives not around here, but we were talking about going on a little fishing trip and I'm going to hit him with some knowledge of dates and whatnot. 
and try to gauge his reaction. You know what I mean? Because normal people <laughs> won't know the dates and times of what he was involved in out there. And when I hit him with certain planes and dates and times and certain things to see if I can get a reaction out of him to see if maybe he will go ahead and pony up the information. Yeah. The more and more I think about it, the more and more I believe Bob. I mean, I've re listened in yeah. that episode or that interview and I've watched the the documentary uh, probably three times. I think Bob Lazar is a hundred percent telling the truth. And you really want to get your mind blown. You listen to Joe's latest interview. I haven't had a chance with David Fravor, which yeah. is exactly what I was commenting on with these Tic Tacs things and the yep. USS Nimitz fleet. Yep. Yeah, it's all coming out. And it's to me, <clears throat> it's almost like it's all coming out because somehow or another, the government thinks that they're not going to be able to stop it. Something soon is going to happen. Something, some yeah. information is going to be leaked soon and they can't stop it. So you might as well let it seem like it's naturally coming out because all of a sudden there seems to just be a lot of talk about it. In fact, we need to have Ryan Sprague on again yeah. uh, to talk about it. I know he does He's our go-to UFO guy. Yeah, absolutely. We need to hit Ryan up. Absolutely. Uh, if you have any cool stories you'd like to share with me and Cam or some news or anything like that, feel free to email the show, expandedperspectives at yahoo.com. Um, and you can follow me and Cam on all forms of social media. Uh, Cam, what do you got planned for your week? Anything exciting? N just regular, sad, old work. That's gotcha. really all the ex been training and been going to work and I may go get in the woods some this weekend. And for those of you that are elite listeners that have already heard what Kyle and I've been up to, we've put, we've put a break on it for the next few weeks. And when Kyle gets done with this next couple of, uh, uh, baseball tournaments, we're going to hit back up the research area. So we'll be going back up. The research area is on a break. The elite show is not on a break. Yeah. In fact, I got another episode. I was just busy editing before the show. Yeah, we're just going to put the research area a little, slow it down a little bit. Actually, I want it to cool off more before I go out there, and then we're going to stay the night. Um, I just got a text ex actually about two days ago from my cousin Jason saying he uh, wants to show us some interesting places out uh, for the elite listener, what we're talking about, in a place of the land where something's happening. Okay, so done. We're going to have to do it. All done. Right. I hope everybody out there has a good week. Till next time, I'm Kyle. He's Cam. Peace, y'all.